You're listening to the really useful podcast from makeuseof.com. My name is Christian Corley. With me is Ben Stegner, and we have news, tips, and tricks for the technophobes among you. This is the tech podcast for technophobes. Ben, how are you? I am doing well. I am actually looking at a stack of boxes in my office that has my new PC components. Ooh. I decided it's time to upgrade, so put in an order for some stuff on Friday, and the uh, rest of it should be here by Thursday. So exciting wow. time! I used to love that time of year. Every sort of well, time of year, that sort of time of every eighteen months, buying either the complete kit or maybe the majority components to upgrade the previous PC. And then since sort of 2013, I've kind of been using just mainly laptops. So I haven't really, I haven't built apart from one for my dad. And I've kind of got one in mind that I want to build for, for purely for Steam purposes. Uh, I haven't built a PC in years for myself. This will only be my second, so right. I'm a little bit nervous because it's been, I like stress out over anything manual like this. So I've done it once before. I know I can do it, but I'll definitely be consulting many guides to make sure I don't screw it up. Yeah. this I mean, this isn't on our um, show plan at all whatsoever, is it? But um, I remember the first time I built a PC. I had some help from a friend because I made a bit of a, a muck-up. I'd ordered, I hadn't got the, uh, I hadn't mixed AMD processor with Intel motherboard or anything like that, but I had got the wrong Intel, uh, the wrong AMD processor for the AMD motherboard. So a friend of mine had to help me out with that. And it was, um, it was going great guns until a tiny shard of metal from one of the rear PCI port covers uh, flew into the... Uh, Oh, no, I want to say PS2, but it wasn't a PS2. It was, prior to, it was the type of keyboard jack before PS2. Um, I, I, I didn't know there was one before PS2. Yeah, so. it was like a big, thick one. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it flew into there and shorted the um, computer, which was a real bugger. It shorted the entire motherboard, oh. and we couldn't get it out. Um, and uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd had, I had a feeling I would be able to do this because purely because <laughs> this is like, oh, I can ride a bike. I can fly a jet plane. I had replaced the floppy drive in my Amiga 1200 about three years before, which involved opening it up, unplugging a ribbon cable and a power cable and putting a new one in. And I thought to myself, I did that then. I can surely do this now. And as you all know, listeners, I now fly tornadoes in the RAF. Uh, no, clearly not the case <laughs> at all. But yeah, um, so yeah, and yeah, over the years I've built loads of PCs. I've, I've, I do feel like listening to you and one of the topics we've got later on, how about airflow i do i do feel a little bit kind of uh, envious and maybe maybe i will sooner rather than later but um we've we've got a few news items to get through some uh, recent topical developments that will affect most people <laughs> there is a new uh, feature in windows 11 which is the ability to run android apps which it's a little bit crazy, uh, you know, go back 10 years, Microsoft was developing its own mobile operating system and now it's uh, thrown that all away and now it lets you basically run Android apps on Windows without any form of uh, additional software or emulation or anything like that. Uh, have you, have you, are you using a version of Windows where you can try this out, Ben? I don't have Windows 11 yet. Um, right. My processor is not compatible, so I will, I plan to move my drive into my new machine, upgrade to Windows 11 there. Um, don't know if I'll try Android apps. I don't really think there's any Android apps that would enhance my workflow on my computer. I'm trying to think if there's any that I would try. No. Can you think of any? Uh, I, I, well, I mean, I've messed around with a few Android-y things uh, on uh, Windows and on Linux that will, you know, like uh, virtual environments that will run Android apps. And the only, I think the, most fun I had was either playing a game or using Instagram. Okay. And that so that's pretty, pretty much basic. It. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm kind of in agreement with you uh, so far. I'm sure there's going to be something. I mean, someone, there is probably undoubtedly a very popular Android app that maybe it hasn't been developed yet, but it will be, or it will be adapted from its current form that will have an amazing kind of uh, use on windows in this 
new environment, but at the moment, no idea what it is. Uh, Microsoft states that eight gigabytes is the lowest amount of RAM that you can have on your system to run Android apps. Uh, the recommended amount of RAM, however, is twice that, 16 gigabytes of storage, uh, which, I mean, it does say in this article I'll make use of, and we'll link to this as we link to everything in our show notes. Ben, you're about to build a PC. How much RAM have you ordered? So my current computer that I built five years ago has the 16 gigabytes of RAM that they're recommending for this. Uh -huh. I ordered 32 gigs there you from go. my new build. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I know I a lot of people say four and eight gigabytes, but I think we are past the point where 16 gigabytes should be sort of de rigueur. Yeah, I think for general use, I think eight is fine. You know, like a general productivity laptop off the shelf, I think eight gigs is fine. Um, if you were building a computer now, I'd say you should put at least 16 in. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that is quite a big requirement, especially like you were saying, if people just want to like install Snapchat on their computer using the Android app or play a game. I mean, I don't think most of those people are going to have 16 gigs of RAM yet. I'd say that was pretty unlikely, yeah. Microsoft also lists the storage type for this as a solid state drive, but the company doesn't list how much space the uh, emulator needs on your storage, just that it has to be an SSD. This is probably due to uh, the speed of an SSD compared with a mechanical hard drive. Processor requirements, if you have something that's at or better than an Intel 8th generation i3, which is quite low, AMD Ryzen 3000 or Qualcomm Snapdragon 8C, you should be okay. But Windows 11 is quite picky with processors, so uh, you may still have a few, uh, few jarring moments there. Having talked about this, I'm still very vague in what benefit this could really bring, I suppose. There are a lot of applications out there. I think there's a list on make use of, of something between five and seven tools that you can use to run Android apps on Windows. So I, I, you know, these are headline names. So bringing the feature into Windows, while I can see why Microsoft have done it, I just don't see a kind of uh, killer application for this. I would agree. I mean, you have stuff like BlueStacks that people use for playing Android exclusive games on it, on Windows. Um, you can. It's been available on Chrome OS for a while too. Yeah. And I don't really think that's been like a system seller there. No. I think I, part of it is just because, I, in my opinion, mobile apps work best on mobile. And I think as much crap as we give the Microsoft Store on Windows 10 and 11 with those apps, store apps, you know, some of them are decent and some of them are PC versions of popular mobile apps. So if you want that like a lighter mobile app experience, most of them are already on there. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. We'll see how it works, how it pans out. I mean, it could... You know, it could turn out to be one of those features that Microsoft puts a lot of effort into and then eventually just, you know, abandons. I mean, they've put a lot of work into their Android apps and integration. I mean, we've talked before, I think, about, you know, the, the your phone feature in Windows 10 and how that's set up to use Android and how Microsoft puts so much work into their Android apps. So I can see them dropping this if people don't end up using it but they probably think it's a good idea just because Android is like the de facto mobile home of Microsoft yeah. stuff now. Yeah. And of course, there's the, there's the other aspect that uh, Microsoft 11 has got this uh, kind of huge virtualization feature built into it as well. So I kind of, I guess it kind of showcases that as well at the same time, doesn't it? Yeah, sure. It makes them show off their new tech and kind of further differentiate Windows 11 from Windows 10 for yeah. people who aren't too keen on switching it yeah yeah let's move on there is a uh, key element of windows uh, 11 and prior to that uh, for a good half of windows 10's lifespan is microsoft edge and uh, it is on the verge of uh, surpassing safari as the second most used browser in the world it's a double-edged sword this one of course microsoft edge is based on it's basically based on chrome isn't it, it uses the same technology as a chrome browser right and Safari obviously doesn't. That's uh, my, uh, that's uh, Apple's browser. Chrome browser has been the number one browser, I think, for most of the last 10 years, if not a little bit beyond that. And, you know, fighting in the background for scraps, you've got uh, Firefox, you've got Opera, you've got Vivaldi, you've got a handful of others on uh, Linux, and a couple of mobile browsers. You've got the Samsung browser, on uh, Samsung mobile devices, which obviously is a big 
chunk of the uh, mobile area. It's considered a fight for second place, but the problem is Microsoft Edge uses basically the same technology as Chrome. Several other browsers use that same technology as well, the underlying uh, code in there, whereas Firefox and Safari, they do not. Ben, you may not remember this. There was a big kind of competition between Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator many, many years ago. And uh, Internet Explorer, quote unquote, won. And Netscape kind of morphed into Firefox. And, you know, at the same time, there was still the Safari thing going on there. So to see Safari sort of slipping, I've never been a big fan of Safari, but to see it slipping in this way uh, is a bit worrying, I think. Yeah, I think it's because Edge is on Chromium, based on Chromium now, and it's basically the same browser. Um, and Safari is a little bit different. This, this, the chart that I'm looking at still has Safari quite a bit ahead, but I think that this study must have been just browser or desktop browsers. Right. And the uh, this probably includes all because the iPhone's so popular and Safari's the default there, obviously, so that bumps the numbers up. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of weird to see Chrome in first and then like a Chrome derivative second. And Firefox is really dropping. I remember when Firefox Quantum came out a couple of years ago, that was supposed to be like a big revitalization. Seems like it's kind of been left alone or not very exciting for most people. I'd completely forgotten about that. The Samsung mobile browser is like competing for the, in the those little small spots, Edge and Opera. It's- if you look at the chart, you can, uh, and we'll include it in the show notes, you can basically get a good look at uh, what the state of play is for the various browsers and the various platforms. And you can, you know, it's, it's a really good uh, chart on Start Counter, which lets you factor all, all sorts of different uh, permutations into it and have a look at what the market share for browsers are, regardless of uh, what device it is. It's quite a cool little tool, actually. I'm quite enjoying playing with it. Yeah, it's fun to see stats for all this kind of thing. There's a search engine use uh, chart, too. Google's at 80.2%. Bing is at 28 It's fun to see the dominance in other areas too yeah yeah as i say we'll include that in the show notes but uh maybe leave it until you don't have anything important to do because you, you might find you get me distracted by it as we just have if you like numbers yeah absolutely or just lines nintendo is discontinuing support for the wii u and 3ds e-shops um so what this basically means is that you can still go out and buy old games for the wii u and the 3ds in physical form I think one of the, uh, the, the the standard DS is, is included in the list as well. Um, but when it comes to uh, things you can download online, purchase in the shop, purchase in DLC, uh, new purchases are going to be slowly removed from the functionality of the eShop. Users can add funds to the Wii U or 3DS directly via credit card until May the 23rd, 2022. You can add funds via a Nintendo eShop card to your Wii U or 3DS eShop account until August 29th, 2022. And you can also link your system's uh, net Nintendo Network ID wallet with the Nintendo account wallet, which is used for the Switch. You may have already done that. I, I have. And that will work until March 2023. Um, but uh, beyond that time, that's when things start to get a bit hairy and things will start to be unavailable if you don't already own them or they're not already free then it's not great is it really yeah i'm not happy to see this at all um we've gone through this with nintendo a few times before like the wi-fi connection service shutting down and the wii shop channel shutting down um if you're if you kind of think like oh the wii u was a, a failure and the 3ds is old what's the point the main issue with this is that the 3ds and the wii u right now are the best place to get a lot of old nintendo games on the virtual console service um so you have games that are really expensive or basically impossible to find to to get a physical copy and you can get them on the eShop for 10 bucks 20 bucks so the wii u is worth holding on to for retro enthusiasts or collectors to get easy copies of these games so when they shut this down not only are physical copies of games for the 3DS and the Wii U going to get expensive, but there's going to be entire digital-only games that are erased, basically, and it's going to get way harder to play a lot of Nintendo's back catalog. Um, The Switch has the NES and SNES, and now the 
N64 online, but the library is paltry compared to what's available on the Wii U. So, you know, the, the, the joke is that Nintendo takes these services away and then someone says, you know, you're going to give us a legal way to play these, right? And then they say no and shut down the emulators and all that stuff. So it's very frustrating for a company with this much history to just kick out the best legal way to play its games and then just tell you tough, you know, spend $200 on a physical copy of a Super Nintendo game. Yeah, I think as well that there is this whole side of Nintendo kind of being rather blasely claiming, well, look, there's 130 games that you can play here. And, you know, there wasn't an awful lot of games on the Wii U released. Uh, I mean, Europe, I think it's like 170. But there's something like, uh, I don't know, 1,500 plus games that will run on the DS. And the 3DS can play yeah. DS games. Yeah, exactly, yes. Which... Yeah, so you've got like, it's potentially running up to 2,000 games, and they're just citing 130 as being like, hey, it's 130 games. It's really, uh, it's shoddy in, in many ways, but uh, the Video Game History Foundation has released a statement on this. Uh, it's quite wordy, but um, they basically start off by saying, while it's unfortunate that people won't be able to purchase digital 3DS or Wii U games anymore, we understand the business reality that went into this decision. But not providing commercial access is understandable, but preventing institutional work to preserve these titles on top of that is actively destructive to video game history. And, uh, you know, there is this other aspect, is that lots of people have spent a lot of time over the past sort of 20 25 years establishing methods to rescue data from cartridges and, and and disc media in order to preserve them i don't think anyone would be unreasonable to feel that perhaps we're past that and that video game companies like nintendo in fact particularly nintendo are more appreciative of the effort that's gone into these uh, endeavors in the past and would make things a lot easier to 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 preserve these games and this is this action is the complete opposite of that isn't it yeah it's frustrating because you know with game preservation it's still easy you know no one's crying over donkey kong country tropical freeze because it's on switch right like the big wii u games are still available on switch you yeah. can get them new version and play them there's a lot of games people haven't heard of or small games that, quite frankly, I might not care about playing them, but I don't want these games to just disappear and never be available to people to play in the future. Um, you know, Sega has, for, for as annoying as it can be, they've released a bunch of like Genesis or Mega Drive compilations, and it's not every game ever made, but it's nice to be able to spend 30 bucks and get 55 Genesis games all in one place for you know, preserve them. You have a copy of them on a modern system, you know, but N N Nintendo, I love the, I love the developments the, the what they, the games they make, but a lot of this stuff drives me crazy. It's just so frustrating that they don't provide any modern way to play old games and just tell you tough and they crack down on emulation, you know, instead of taking those developers that spend thousands of hours preserving their own games, they do a better job than the company does. They can bring those people on board to have these efforts, but they don't. Yeah, it is, uh, I'm, it, it is frustrating. And, you know, there are many people out there building their own sort of solutions to playing old games. You've also got a different device, which is called the Tiny NES which basically is, is, imagine the size of a uh, Nintendo Mini, a NES Mini, but with a full-size cartridge jammed in the top of it. Mini. Yeah, basically, original scale yeah. of the cartridge, yeah. And that's the tiny NES. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of these things going on. And I think these play a big part into what we're saying here about the, um, you know, enabling all games to be played. A lot of them don't exist digitally and legally and it's very difficult to play old cartridges you, i mean cartridges lost a, last seem to last a lot longer than the original hardware even uh more recent cartridges that have the batteries in them that you know they're not going to last forever and save games going to 
get lost and things like that. that that's that's part of the video game preservation stuff that people can forget and that you just commented on is that like this stuff doesn't last forever. Like video games are so new compared to other forms of media. Like can you think about like books rotting, you know, you have to preserve them when they're yeah. a thousand years old or whatever. Like games, discs can rot, cartridges can go bad. So it's important that we have new ways to play them that's not just the original hardware plus like the mini one you said that's great because i'm sure that connects to a modern tv but an original nes eventually modern tvs aren't going to have that connection anymore so you're going to have to hardwire your own solution to output it to a modern tv that kind of thing yeah absolutely and it's really frustrating too that when nintendo a lot of the time does release like the super mario 3d all-stars collection near the end of 2020 and people found out that it was basically just a ROM they downloaded and tweaked when you can play a widescreen version of Mario 64 on PC that someone put a ton of time into and it's a way better version of the game than the one Nintendo is selling back to you for $60 like it's frustrating yeah like, I've, I've said that a bunch of times but yeah, I'm yeah. Feel about it. <laughs> um, just on the matter of uh, cartridges with batteries there is a project called save the hero which was a successful Kickstarter project and it's uh based on the work of a developer called Sunny. And it's basically a cartridge reader that you can dump cartridges, including any save files that are still working on that cartridge, uh, to an SD card. And you can get it on Kickstarter, but it's going global uh, in a few months' time. So you should be able to uh, buy it from most kind of uh, gaming specialists. So that's uh, worth keeping in mind. Um, ben and I have... Uh, both got a bit of an interest in sort of uh, game preservation from a Nintendo point of view. Now is probably a good time to bring this up. Unplanned, but we'll bring it up anyway. Okay. The whole Nintendo 64 on the Switch thing. I think the $50 a month price is ridiculous. Um, if it was like $10 more a month and there was the premium plan was like $30. I'm sorry, not, it's not $50 a month, $50 a year. Um, even that is ridiculous, I think. If it was like $30 a year, up from 20 from the main plan, I would get that. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the route that they're going now is bundling in additional DLCs with the service. So when they announced it, they said you get the Genesis and N64 libraries. You get the Animal Crossing New Horizons DLC, which is normally like 25 bucks, And then they just announced this Mario Kart 8 DLC pack, which I think is also going to be $25. But if you have the expansion pack subscription and then that's included in that so it seems like they're going to try to add a bunch of value to it which if they add dlc for games that everybody has like mario kart and smash it could work but i don't know i'd rather just pay 25 bucks and get those tracks than be locked into paying 50 dollars a year for it and then if i don't want it anymore and i cancel then i lose those tracks again it's the same thing as everything else it makes me happy that they're taking steps to bring N64 games to the Switch, but it's years late and it's overpriced. And and the ports aren't very good anyway. I think we talked about that before. Yeah. It's like super laggy and just not well optimized. You can get it's 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 years behind where N64 emulation is on PC and it, these are Nintendo's games. You think you think they'd do a better job yeah, than totally. hobbyists that do it for free? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, no, I'd I'd agree with that. I have not yet set foot in the uh, n64 world on the switch uh because i don't really f i don't feel that it is robust enough it's uh if you've if you've never played some of these games you could sign i don't i don't think you can even sign up for a month you have to do a year so yeah. i mean to pay well, the thing is i don't want to get a, a bad impression of some of these games as well because i only had like right. a handful of cards on the on the original nintendo 64 and one of them is goldeneye which i don't think you can play not yet anyway on the switch anyway but and another one was Rogue Squadron. Is that available? I don't think it is right now. Right, okay. I, GoldenEye is like a mess legally because yeah. it's a movie tie-in game made by Rare on a Nintendo system. I don't know if that game will ever be re-released. It's such a sticky situation. Well, the, 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 um, the, the, it, it appears that um, there's some achievements for Xbox were uh, leaked by Wario64 on Twitter on January the 1st. And there was obviously a leak... You know, say obviously as if the the listeners know about this. There was a, a port of Goldeneye 007 made for the Xbox in about 2007 2008, which was never released, and it was leaked online early last year. And it has two modes: it has a 
basic uh, original Nintendo 64 mode and then an upgraded Xbox 360 version and it was supposed to have been released on Xbox Live uh, but that never happened and then within maybe a year or two years the re-release of the remake of GoldenEye for the Nintendo Wii which replaced uh, had a whole bunch of new maps and levels basically the same setting but replaced replaced Pierce Brosnan with Daniel Craig that was released so and everyone kind of forgot about the Golden Eye for Xbox until it reappeared last year. There may be a chance that that's actually getting released, but aside from that, when it comes to the Nintendo 64, it's not entirely clear. I do remember that Wii version that was kind of like a remake, like an enhanced remake. Yeah, I it's never playable, but it's not great. To... Yeah, I've heard it's okay. I guess Perfect Dark kind of took up the the, the mantle from there since yeah, it's a similar yeah. gameplay style and yeah. doesn't have the legal issues. But what I was going to say was, if you want to play these games, you know, you've never played Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask is coming, Banjo-Kazooie's there, all some of my favorite games ever. If you've never played them before, it's way better to spend 50 bucks and then you have a year to play these games instead of trying to track down an original cartridge or, you know, pay $20 for the Wii U version that's going away or whatever. So it's, it's something, but it should be better. We reached that point of the show now in which we discuss our recommendations for this week. Now, uh, Ben has something he wishes to share with you. I do too. Now, there's a slight problem with this, Ben, is that I told you I wanted to suggest item A, and you may have checked this out in order for us to discuss it. But I've actually remembered something else that I encountered in the past week, which I think would be far more fun to discuss. Is All that right. okay? You go first then. Okay. Yeah, go for it. So... Uh, have you played uh, Wordle? Yes. Okay. I haven't because I'm kind of uh, I'm one of those contrarians who is uh, kind of uh, socially allergic to that thing that everyone else is doing. So I Generally, I am too, <laughs> but if I like it, I make an exception. And in this case, I like Wordle. So. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I avoided it completely. And then, a few days ago, and th this will seem familiar to many listeners uh my, my uh, retro love got the better of me and i discovered that someone had developed a version of wordle called turtle for the commodore 64 and the c64 mini and uh and the vice 64 and any other emulators um it's basically along the same lines only all the answers are toilet themed I was going to say, there had, where does Turtle come in? Is that related to the Commodore, or that answers my question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. So, it's um, being developed by a guy called Roy Storini, and it is available to download free on itch.io, but you can play it in your browser anyway, so you don't even need a Commodore 64. I mean, you know, it's a 40-year-old computer, so you probably don't have one handy. You don't even need to use the emulator, and you don't even need a C64 Mini. Uh, from Retro Games Limited, you can just play it in your browser. And it is quite a bit of fun. I had a little play on it. Well, more than one little play on it. It's it's amusing. I suspect I have more fun with it than I would have done with uh, Wordle. I think uh, it's been fun seeing all these Wordle variations crop up. One of my friend groups has been into it. So they've found Oodle, which is the numbers one. Okay. And then Quirtle, which is where you play four words at the same time. Oh, right. You get two extra chances. Um, we've been talking about that one in Slack too. You might have saw that. So yeah. I think the idea of the different ones is funny, but also how many different words are there for poop? You know, like well, it's it, not all Wordle... it's not all for poop. It's just toilet related. I discovered oh, when I had a look okay. at it. So yeah, but uh, no, I appreciate your concern there because I did wonder that myself before I started well, playing it. I, I'm, I don't mean that in like a prudish way. I mean it in like a practical <laughs> way. Like in Wordle, there's a million words to guess. But when you know it as only things to do with toilets, like it's it's almost like you have to think of a word that fits it. Like it's a challenge to just come up with a word, I guess. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you're making me, you're just making me giggle by using those words like I'm a bloody schoolboy. <laughs> I'll have to give it a try, and I'll send you all the words I came up with. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. That's a deal. So what, what about you, Ben? What's your recommendation this week? So my recommendation for this week is one that I thought of when we were recording the last show, and so glad I remembered it. So it is a 
it's largely on Wikipedia and Twitter. I'm sorry, Instagram and Twitter. It is an account called Depths of Wikipedia. So as far as I know, it's just run by one person. And she just highlights funny, weird goofy stuff in Wikipedia. So whether that's just articles that are funny to begin with, or just screenshots that are funny, like, have you heard of jester's privilege? It's the ability and right of a jester to talk and mock freely without being punished for nothing he says seems to matter. Ooh. Like, why is that a Wikipedia article? There's an art, like she highlights an article about showing how to do the up high, down low, too slow, <laughs> high five, trick weird songs things you've never heard of like that so i love like wikipedia and information so seeing like the weird stuff on there i've i've found out about a lot of events and things through this page that i just find hilarious so and sometimes the screenshot like the, the context that she chooses to highlight makes it even funnier so if you're into wikipedia definitely give it a follow as ever we'll include the show notes to our recommendations so you can check them out for yourself that brings us neatly to the end of this week's really useful podcast from makeuseof.com. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter if you are just uh, new to Make Use Of. And if you subscribe to the show, you will get notifications when a new episode is available. We'll be back next time. Until then, it's goodbye. <laughs>